what I do around here is kind of just the advancement of, of, of this is who you are. Um, I can see better than you for some reason about who you really are, and I have a direction that I know that we need to go on, and that's the, just the adventure for me of um, doing what I do on a daily basis, of just inviting people into who they truly are when they don't really believe it yet. Um, but for some reason, me and my team can see it, and we just say, let's, let's go this direction. So uh, I have, I have uh, some words I want to read to you guys. So this is uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Yes, we are doing 1 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, verse 2. So this is right at the beginning of the letter. This is Paul writing to the church in Corinth, and we'll get into that in just a minute. But uh, just to set the stage here, this is what we're going to do. Uh, verse 2, to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be holy, together with all those everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours, grace and peace to you from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in him you have been enriched in every way. Say every way. Every way. In all your speaking and in your knowledge because our testimony about Christ was confirmed in you. Isn't that cool? Whatever, it's cool. Yeah. Therefore you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will keep you strong to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God, who has called you into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, is faithful. That's good stuff right there, right? And that's kind of the springboard I want to go off of in this, is just, first of all, understanding why Paul is writing these things, what's going on in Corinth, and then kind of just, uh, you know, mixing around just a little bit for um, what I think God has for us to hear tonight. And, and really, Corinth was a town in Greece, and it wasn't like Athens was the town, right? And this is not Athens. And it's a town of about, uh, they say, 250,000 people, wait for it, 400,000 slaves. <laughs> that's a ratio there, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> kind of crazy. And so it's a large town, and that's the point. Uh, it's a port town, so it's a high in, uh, economic uh, trade value. So, so like they, got, they got some stuff going on, right? And... It's a, it's a pagan town. They got, uh, I don't know, let's just say a thousand, because why not? Um, a few hundred, if, if that, just the gods that they are allowed to worship. And that's kind of like the context that a normal person from Corinth would, would come to, to read this letter as. And so he, they're reading this letter, and I don't know if you picked up from what I read there, but, but Paul is definitely inviting them into something. He's saying, hey, I give thanks to you uh, because of what God has done to you, and he's brought you into something, our Lord, their Lord, all together. And they, this is something that's super significant to whoever's reading this thing. It's not just like this pagan thing where it's just like, cleanse me for a minute, but it's an actual invitation into something. And this is the call of Christianity that I don't think we get quite as good as we should. I think we have a grasp of knowledge on this one, but I kind of just wanted to take you through my story of how I got to understand this just a little bit better. This isn't just that, like, uh, I, I believe in Jesus, therefore I'm good. I believe in Jesus, therefore I'm clean. I believe in Jesus, therefore I can take a deep breath today. This is a matter of, of actually being of something. And that's super important. And this is what uh, Paul introduces this letter first as, because I don't know if you've read Corinthians lately or have just an understanding, a slight understanding of what Corinthians is all about. But it's pretty much this, this harsh, corrective letter to a bunch of run-amuck pagans. <laughs> it is, he starts with this, this very loving introduction. And I think we just need to read it again, just to get that, that context of what I'm trying to, to, to communicate this evening. So let's just go to verse 4. I always thank God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus, for in him you have been enriched in every way, in all your speaking, in all your knowledge, because our testimony about Christ has, or, sorry, was confirmed in you. It's like, yes, Jesus is alive, because look at the life you're leading, man, this is awesome. We're part of something. And then right after that, he starts ripping them because of the division that's in the church. And he doesn't stop there, right? He goes on to moral issues after that. Uh, sexual immorality being his favorite little nugget uh, coming out of that one. And then he moves into church uh, business uh, after that, just how to treat apostles, how to treat each other. Like it's, this is a massive corrective letter. 
But he starts in a place that says, wow, you guys are awesome. Don't you know what you guys have been uh, bought into? You've been brought into something. You've, you've been brought into some a family, if you will. You've been brought into a community, something that says we're going this direction now. And since we're going this direction now, how about we do things this way? Right. It's not just a matter of a pagan mentality. Are you guys with me? It's not just a, in terms of a pagan mentality of saying, I need Jesus to cleanse my life. Although that's part of the Christian journey. That's not the full part of it. It is definitely an invitation into his life, your life, in his life, his mission, your mission, your mission, his mission. And that is massive as, as we reach and understand this, this Christian journey that we've uh, all said yes to. See, like I, I was messed up before I said yes to Jesus. I was messed up. I was extremely dysfunctional. I came from a dysfunctional family. My dad was, a, uh, was an alcoholic till that time I was five years old. So I don't remember much of that time, um, but I do remember just getting raised in dysfunction. Um, my, my mom didn't come from a Christian household at all. My dad got radically saved one night where he just said, God help me. And in a moment, um, he never drank again. Still hasn't drank to this day. So I don't know, do the math, long time ago. And, and so that obviously woke up our family just a little bit. And we went in, into a direction of church. And, you know, we, I went to church as a kid and, you know, saw some fun things and whatever. And, just, it was, it was the liturgical church. I don't know if you know what that is, but I call it the stand-up, sit-down church, you know? Certain songs you sit for, certain songs you stand for, right? You got the format, do-do-do-do. You got the Jesus, God, and the holy pipe organ, you know, like that whole thing, you know, in a pretty, uh, pretty awesome environment. That's my brother's joke, so full credit to him on that one. And that was the kind of... And my, my dad in, in 95... Uh, goes to Toronto and gets radically just uh, saved, just radical experience with God where everything changed, where his, his life went completely. We went to this, this uh, Dry's Toast uh, church, and then all of a sudden we're going to this crazy charismatic church where everybody's jumping around, waving flags and laughing and flopping on the ground. And I'm going, wow, we're on a different planet now. <laughs> and then my brother gets radically saved, right? And I'm watching this stuff, and I'm going... I will have nothing to do with this. I don't want anything to do with this. I see my, li- my brother's lives getting changed. I want nothing to do with this. I become more and more independent. I'm going to live my life the way I want to live my life. Don't tell me what to do. The only reason I will follow you, if I agree with you, I was a good worker only because oh, if I got my selfish needs met. You ever, everybody hearing my story on this one? Yeah, it's just like this is the direction I was going with my life. I was... I was completely messed up. I hated everybody. I didn't want to have friends. The more alone I could be, the better. I drove everybody away from my life on purpose. I'm just trying to remember the year it was. I think it was 98. Long time ago. I had a job, and uh, it was a seasonal thing, so it was the last day of the season. We all went out for, hey, goodbye, whatever, right? And I sat there with these people, and I looked around. And like, these are the people I spent probably four months with every day. Butt crack at dawn to late at night, you know, just you know, every day. And I just stood up in the middle of the crowd and got up and left. Walked out the door, didn't say goodbye to anybody. Just left, never saw them again. Like, that was me. Like, I didn't want people in my life. Get away from me. So I pushed everybody away. Um, it, it went into, like, everybody, or should, maybe you don't know. Like, I, I had a bit of an athletic hurrah there for a minute. And I, I just absolutely pushed everybody away on that thing. If I touched it, it turned to garbage. And that was how it was. And, and to be quite honest, that's how I liked it. And I met Jesus somehow. My dad invites me to church because, remember, crazy charismatic church now, right? Do you want to come to church, Jordy? <laughs> no, <laughs> not at all. That's where weird people are. So we're not going there. And, and uh, uh, for some reason, I just heard it in his voice, Jordy, do you want to come to, to church with me? And, uh, you know, that's where I met Jesus, for real. He was there. I was sitting there with my head in my hands going, what are we doing here? And God met me face to face, if you will. You know, I didn't see God, but he was there. Like, I knew he was there, undeniable, more real than any living thing. Just, he was there. And I was just, 
okay, I, there's a fork in the road moment. Either I can go after what I know is real or I can continue on this path of dysfunction. And I chose correctly and I chose going after him. But here's the deal, guys. It's like I was still screwed up. All I, the, the only right thing I've ever done in my life is say yes to Jesus. So here's this, this letter that I'm reading you guys, this, this Corinth church, right? They, they know nothing but the wrong way. And then all of a sudden, Paul leads them to Jesus. Jesus, yes. Here he is. He's got a church. He's got a crowd. He says, yes. Let's change this, this dynamic that you guys have. And then he drops this nugget on him, just going, look who you are. Look what you're part of. This is so good. You might want to change a few things, though, <laughs> because that's not what we do now. now we've, we've invited you into a different way. And here's, here's this, the deal about my story, is that I knew there was a different way. And nobody wanted to tell me what that different way was. Everybody wanted to tell me, was like, well, you got your job, Jordy, and then you got church. Just make sure those, don't think, those two things don't mix. You definitely don't want your work to affect your church, but you definitely don't want your church to affect your work. Those things don't exist. So let's just keep them at bay. Let's keep this thing simple. That there was things that I wanted to know in my life, like all of us want to know, like, what do I do now that I'm a Christian? What do I do now? What do I do about this situation now that I'm a Christian? And I just wanted to hear this stuff from the pulpit all the time, right? Just tell me how to live. Anybody with me on this one? Tell me how to live. Tell me how to do this, this thing right, because I've met Jesus. And I know this thing is supposed to be more than just warming a seat here. And put my money in a bucket when it comes on by. Like, there's got to be more than this. And I'm waiting, and I'm dying, and then people would tell me, well, read a psalm a day. Read a proverb a day. Read Ezekiel. Anybody read Ezekiel lately? Creepy stuff going on there. It's like, like it, all, that, all that caused me to do is shove my Bible under my couch. I'm not reading that silly thing anymore. It's so confusing. And so what I did is now I'm listening to people. I was traveling places, going across the town, going to places. Tell me how to live. Nobody wanted to tell me how to live. And it was very distressing because I, here I am, I'm still screwed up, I'm still depressed, I still hate people, but I love Jesus. I know this is wrong. Okay, I know the big ones, guys. Don't kill people, got that one, yeah, right? Don't steal, got that one. Oh, uh, what's the other one? Um, adultery, that was actually the one I was going for. Yeah, don't, don't give me adultery, you know, like, don't be... Uh, you know, that, that sex thing, keep it woo, where it needs to be, you know. Yeah, like, I, like, I know all those big ones, right? But the, it's like the little stuff. It's like, what do I do with my money, really? Like, how do I live my life? I'm supposed to tell people about Jesus, but I hate you. <laughs> this is weird. Don't know how I'm supposed to do this. I want to share my heart with you guys today because I think this is what we need to hear. We need to get on this page here that, this, that, that, that you're not just, this Jesus thing isn't just into your life to make your life cleanse. There's a purpose to following Jesus. And like what I wanted to hear, my, I just begged people, just tell me what I need to hear. I need to know these things, how to live. And so here I got the microphone today. And I'm telling you, there is a way to live. There's a standard to the living that you said yes to. And it's not hidden from you. It's not in Psalms. It's not in Proverbs. Could be in Ezekiel. I don't know. I haven't read it lately. <laughs> right? But I'm just going to venture a guess. Probably not. <laughs> but I'm telling you that there is, there is a way. And like, like me and Steph, we, we traveled all over the place like finding Jesus, trying to find Jesus. Oh, are you here? Like we felt the, the, the nudgings of God to, to go to Toronto. And that was a fantastic time for us. And we found out about the Holy Spirit. We found out about his love for us, and we found out about a part of community. We, we found out how to have friends, or I did anyway. 27 years old, learning how to have friends. I'm at this church, right? Just got to paint the picture for you. There's probably 3,000 people there, maybe less than that on a, on a Sunday. There's a whole pile of people there. You, you guys get the picture? There's a whole pile of people there, and I am alone, right? I'm going, there's something wrong with this. And like, well, I should have a group of friends. And I'm thinking, like, I don't even know how to make friends. <laughs> Why do I do this? Well, anyway, that was my adventure going on that one. And then we heard that uh, something was going on uh, just up the road here in Reading. It's just like people are, like, there's an engagement with their Christianity of people on the streets. And I want to go there. I want to do stuff. There it is. Maybe that's it. 
Maybe that's, this is where my Christianity is going to get engaged. Maybe this is what, what uh, the answer is, and the world is flocking there, and so I want to be part of whatever's going on. And so I'm chasing after it, and then we get there, and it's like, ah, it's good. Like, we learned stuff, and it was awesome. Anytime you just follow Jesus, it's awesome. But it's just like, oh, there's something not there, man. Nobody's telling me how to live. How do I get along with people? What do I do with this addiction that I have? What do I do? Like, I would go out with my friends, and we would smoke and we would drink and talk about Jesus. Nobody told me that was bad. Everybody told me that was cool. Going to ministry school. <laughs> nobody, nobody questioned it. It was just, okay, I guess this is cool then. I guess we, we do this. I don't know. This, this doesn't feel right, though. But Jesus is here. Something's happening. So here's Paul going back to this letter again. 1 Corinthians. Here's Paul going, wow, guys, look at you, man. You guys are so messed up. But look at who, look at who you are. What, look what you've been bought into. You got into a place, like, you, you, you've been brought into a story. You've been brought into a story that has a beginning and has an end. It's not like a pagan story which says you go to the temple to be cleansed for a minute and then you're back at square one. That's not what, what this Jesus story is all about. This Jesus story is you've been brought into an adventure, into a journey. And somewhere along the line, you're definitely not at the beginning and we're definitely not at the end, but we're moving this story forward. And we actually get to be part of something that actually advances the story forward. And that is what we've been bought into. And this is your position as a Christian. And this is the stuff I've picked up in the last 10 years. About I am part of a story. I'm not just like here to like, ah, oh, my life is better now. It's a matter of, it doesn't matter if my life is good or bad. It's a matter of I get to move the story along. Demonstrating his goodness to the people around me. Knowing who he is. Demonstrating who he is through the life that I choose to follow. It's not just a matter of tell me how to live. It's a matter of I get to live because of how, what he shows me. And so here I am, and, and I come to the, to the Father's house, and I'm, I'm desperate. Like, I just want my Christianity to work, people. I love Jesus. I know what it should look like. I'm screwed up. I don't know how to engage these two things. And here's Steve in front of me just going, like, just, you're confused. Just follow Jesus. I can do that. I love the Bible. When I, when I first said yes to Jesus, I read the Bible front to back because I thought it was a book. <laughs> right? I'm like, what's going on here, man? And so I didn't understand the first time, so I did it twice. Didn't help. Like, whatever. I don't know what I'm doing. This guy's telling me to read this. This guy's telling me to read that. Whatever. Anyway, so Steve gets up and just says, just do this. Just do this. Just focus on this. And that's what I did. I just focused on Jesus. Remember, I met Jesus. That fateful day when I went to church with my dad. I met Jesus. So I'll do that. I'll follow Jesus. I know if I get behind Jesus, I'll be all right. And so that's what I did. I just got in Jesus' wake, if you will. And just, all right, let me, let me see. Let me go. Let me hear. Let me understand. Let me question. Let me figure this out. Here we go. And it was in this whole journey here, Matthew chapter 6. Where he drops this little, Jesus drops this little nugget on us. And he says, don't worry. Don't worry. Okay, I'm, I'm following Jesus. I want to get this life right. I've been brought into a story. I'm going to nudge this journey forward somehow, right? He says, don't worry. Like, what? I've been at this journey for I don't know how long now. Six years before I showed up here. First time I've ever seen that. I've probably read it a couple of times. First time I've ever seen it. Don't worry. How are we supposed to do this? And then he dropped. And he, Jesus doesn't stop, obviously. He goes to the next thing. He says, seek the kingdom first. Seek first the kingdom of God. And so that's what I did. Okay, if that's what Jesus is telling me to do, then that's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to seek the kingdom of God. So God, where are you? What does your kingdom look like? I need to find you. I need this direction in my life. I'm a screwed up individual. <laughs> I need to figure this out. My Christianity has to start working at some point. And so here I am, just plugging along, man. Hoping at some point my Christianity is going to work. And it starts to work. 
And then the fateful day happens. And uh, I get emotional at this. I apologize. Maybe I'm not going to apologize. I don't know. Um, but uh, I read Ephesians. I read Ephesians. And this is the passage right here where I woke up. Out of my stupor. Out of my confusion. It was on the seek first the kingdom of God thing. And this passage right here I read in Ephesians. Everything clicks. And I get mad. The reason I get mad is because it's plain as day. It's in my Bible. Exactly what we're all looking for. And that's the direction. And I, I read it and I freak out. I'm sitting at a table. I remember I remember this clear as day. <laughs> I'm sitting at a table. I read it. And I am so mad, I get out of my chair. Nobody's around, right? And I start yelling and screaming. And I say, it's right there. Why didn't anybody tell me? Like I said, I've read it a bunch of times. <sighs> you're going to hear it again. I'm going to read it to you guys. And you go, so what? Like, you, gotta, you have to realize that this is when the light came on for me. Of, I'm invited into a journey with him. This isn't just how do you be a nice Christian Jordy. How do you engage in certain things? This isn't just how do I make my life right again. This is the next step on a journey that has an end. It's a journey with Jesus, pushing his story along. And he says, Jordy, I want to use you for my story. We're going to do this together, man. I need you to move my story along. Let's go. Let's rip, man, because I need you to be part of this thing. This isn't just a matter of how do I make my life good so I can continue to have work six days a week, go to church on Sunday, go to work six days a week. You guys know what I mean by that? Those, those two things never meet, you know? This is not, that's not what this is. That's a pagan w worldview about how we do, how we do uh, Christianity. That's not what it is. Paul is bringing this, this Corinthian church into this understanding that you're part of a journey now. I am with you. You're with me. Your job is to advance the story along for as long as you got breath in your lungs. For the next person to get it, where they get to move the story along until we find the end. And this is where you just hang on to the end. And this is what Paul is saying in Corinthians when he says, let's just hang on to the end until Jesus comes. That is not just a matter of let's sit back, relax, until wait, wait till Jesus comes. It's a matter of you have a job to do, push this baby through, hang on until the end. Because you have a role and responsibility to this world and the, and the world around you. To yourself. Like, it, it's for yourself and the people around you. It's a journey that, that we've uh, bought ourselves into. And so this is the, the scripture right here that I read and I freak out. And then I was stuck on this stuff for years. I read Ephesians 4 and 5 over and over and over. And if you're in school and ministry with me at that time, I spend a lot of time in this. Not many people are, are from that day anymore. Uh, but whatever. All right, so here we go. So this is Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1. Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a, live a life of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. You guys have heard that one a hundred times, yeah? I've also heard that one a hundred times. I've always heard that one spun into a context that says, go do the stuff he wants you to do. Go heal people. Go do this stuff. After all, you're imitators of God, right? It's like, that doesn't mean anything to me, though. It doesn't, that doesn't grip me in, the, in like, how do I do life? Imitate what? <laughs> Imitate God? Okay. Like, like, that's ridiculous. How am I supposed to do that? Like, that doesn't mean anything. That's a nice little sound bite. I'll read that one to you and go, amen, brother. But that doesn't help me on my day to day. It doesn't help me get friends. It doesn't help me manage my finances. It doesn't help me manage with my wife. It doesn't help me do my job. It doesn't help me. 
It inspires me for a minute. Okay, that's, that's the goal, right? So I've heard that one a hundred times. But it was the next part that just like lassoed me around the neck, man. Woo! And it got me real good. All right, here we go. Verse 3. But among you there should be not a, even a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or of greed. Because it is improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscen- obsc- obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place. But rather thanksgiving, for of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a man as an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things God wrath comes on those who are disobedient, therefore do not be partners with them. For you were once darkness, but now you're light of the Lord. Live as children of light. I read that and freaked out lost it it's right there gives you the standard of what to live by don't do these things do these things and if i had time enough we'd read ephesians chapter 4 because it's another chapter full of do this don't do that why do you think paul is telling the church in, in ephesus these things because they're also part of the story of uh, the, the Corinthians church. Uh, like a parallel story of going, check it out. You're now part of a journey. You're, you're part of a story now. You're not just, this isn't just the coming to Jesus and feeling cleansed for a minute. This is taking on a new standard, a new way of living, a new life. Right. And this new life advances the kingdom of God. Right. This life that we say yes to is now an advancement of the kingdom of God on this earth. And everything just came clear to me when I read that thing. I was just going, there it is. Like I told you, I told you it would fall flat. But I'm telling you, like, this is the scripture that everything awoke. There's a standard to the life that you said yes to. Verse 3, but even among you, there's must not even be a hint of sexual immorality. You know how many Christians we get coming in here that we have to deal with on sexual immorality? Because nobody told them. Do I have to describe what sexual immorality is? Probably not. Use your imagination. Okay, that's enough. Not even a hint of sexual immorality. And I deal with people, obviously, who, who are longtime Christians coming. I've struggled with this for years, Jordy. And we're the first people that have told you this? See, there's something wrong with this, and this is fairly a passion of mine. <laughs> all right. Nobody told you? No, it was just all under the blood, baby. There's grace. I'm a child of God. Well, well, yes, yes. But you're also invited into a journey. You're part of a story, advancing his story. Do you think that's part of a story? This is where we'll get all mixed up in this pagan worldview of going, I have this, fix me. Aphrodite was a, 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 a goddess, uh, had a temple in Corinth. One thousand prostitutes served there to do temple cleansing, to do cleansing of whatever, right? To get you back to inner peace. Messed up, isn't it? We do the very same thing with Jesus. I'll just use you for a minute, Jesus, so I feel better about myself. I'm not part of your story, don't care about your story don't want your story. I just want to feel better about myself. And when I, re- when I read this, I don't know how many years ago, freaked out. It's right there. Nobody's telling us how to live. Paul is. Once this light got clicked on for me, guys, I couldn't stop seeing this stuff in the Bible. It's not just in Ephesians. It's in Corinthians, it's in 2 Corinthians, it's in Romans, it's in Galatians, it's in Colossians, it's in Revelation. I can go on. (laughs) It's everywhere because it's a lifestyle that you say yes to of going, yes, I'll be part of the journey of Jesus. 
the story that has a beginning that I don't know anything about, except for some stories, and I don't really know what the end looks like, but I trust Jesus because he is faithful. And I, I have a place along the journey that's going to move his kingdom of God. And whatever uh, little, little breath that we are uh, in our lifetime, we get to move his story forward. Isn't that fantastic? How are we going to move his story forward? Continue acting like sexually immoral people? Greedy? Idolaters? No, that's ridiculous. He says, and this is, this is the best part right here. In, uh, in verse, uh, chapter, verse 8, sorry. For you were once darkness... But now you're light of the Lord. Live as children of light. Live as if you have a standard of saying, I am with Jesus. And I get to advance the story a little bit further today. I get to demonstrate how a marriage should work. I get to demonstrate how people with money who believe in Jesus operate. I get to believe what hope looks like. I get to trust in the Lord of what faith really is. I get to demonstrate what love is. This is our job right now, to demonstrate this, of saying the lifestyle I said yes to isn't just a matter of inner peace, but it's a matter of advancing his story. And if it means you're going to kill me, then kill me, because i got to advance his story. That's the life I said yes to. If it means i got to lose stuff, then lose stuff, because it's not about gaining or losing. It's about advancing. And that's the proper worldview we got to get when, when, we, when we say yes to Jesus. I say yes to a certain lifestyle that says I'm not going to thieve anymore. Because me as a thief out there demonstrates that I'm no longer a child of God. It means I'm still participating in the darkness. I was blasted between the eyes on this one. I had no idea that when I buy a car, I don't lie about how much I bought it for. You don't do that? I'm a pastor at the Father's House Church. And I got blasted. I, I, I just like, Bruh? really? I bought a car, like 8% of $4,000 is a lot of money. I could use that money for something else. So I bought it for $1,000, right? Pay 80 bucks tax rather than hundreds of dollars of tax, right? All right, anybody else agree with me? Don't put your hand up, whatever. Okay, like, if you lied about that number, you just stole some money. You're a thief. But, like, to me, it was just, like, that that was so normal. That's just what you do, right? That's just, like, the the church in Corinth of just, like, you don't do these things? Like, the sexual immorality that was going on in Corinth at that time. Read stories about that. Not very long. Just, like, woo, they'll blow your hair back. Just, like, Wow. We thought we were immoral in 21st century North America. Dang, right? It's just. Anyway, it's just, like Paul had to point this out, going, this ain't okay. <laughs> we don't do this. There's, there's a nature, there's a standard to being a Christian, to say yes to, to the life that you said yes to, to Jesus that you're following, the person that you're representing. Who are you representing? You're representing him. It matters what you do. It matters how you think. It matters how you, how you demonstrate your Christianity. Right. And sometimes we take this Christianity thing for granted, and we just we say, Jesus, I need you to find inner peace for a minute. That's fine. Like, he will bring you peace. That is his name, the Prince of Peace. But that's not the sole purpose. The sole purpose is for you to figure out your place within this story. What is your place in this story? I think we ought to contemplate on that one for a minute, don't we? You have a place in this story. He wants to use you. He wants to demonstrate his goodness, and he wants to shine like stars in the universe. He wants us to stand out, to shine, so people look at us and go, what is wrong with you? You don't steal? You don't do these things? No, I don't. Let me tell you why. Because it's a lifestyle I said yes to. I'm with Jesus. He hasn't let me down. I'm not going to let him down either. I'm with him. I'm with him. And so my life is going to look like I am with him. I went on a journey for six years trying to find somebody who would tell me, live this way. 
And I get to be that person now. Check it out, guys. There is a way to live. There is a standard to follow. And we hear it around here all the time, and you're going to hear it again right now. Everybody ready? Write it down. Again, listen to Jesus. Get in his wake. Follow what he says. Allow, ask questions. Ask, like I do a Bible study with some individuals around here. And like my, my best advice to them is just read it and ask why. Not why in a, in a rebellious way, but why in trying to find out. Why? Why do the disciples say this? Why does Jesus say that? Why do the crowds respond like this? Man, It'll just enrich your Bible reading life. You just ask the question, why? It gets you right into the story. This is where you get all this. Like, why does Jesus pile over the tables in the temple? Why? Ask yourself that. Ask the question of the text. Why? Right? Just find out why. There's a direction that we're going. I'm going after Jesus. I'm going after Jesus. And my life better look like I'm going after Jesus. Everybody with me on this one? What does a man that's going after Jesus, what does it look like? And I'm telling you, a great place to start is reading that, just that, that little passage in Ephesians just to get your set, just set you right, just a little bit. I'm going, wait a minute. No sexually immoral? No, no kinds of impurity? Greed? Those are improper for God's holy people? No obscenity? Foolish talk? Coarse joking? Uh-oh. But rather thanksgiving? Oh, I love this part. No immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a man as an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of God, or sorry, Christ and of God. <sighs> I'd say that's a words to listen to right there. This is a big deal to me. It should be a big, de- big deal to you. This isn't just believing in Jesus for some inner peace. This is believing in Jesus, knowing that he's brought you into his story. And you get to represent his story. You get the responsibility to move his story along towards the end. That's pretty cool, isn't it? How are we going to demonstrate that? How are we going to demonstrate this Christianity? I better look like him. I better look like what he cares about. So here's the deal. is that The Church of Corinth allowed... Corinth to infiltrate the church. And Paul said, eh, 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 we ain't doing that. This is how we're going to do stuff. Let me write you a big old fat letter. This is how you get along with each other. This is how you do things in the church. This is the proper way to do stuff. Because you're brought into a story that has a beginning and it has an end and you have a place in it. How are we doing, church? You have a place in it. You have a place in it. We don't come to the temple to get cleansed. We come to Jesus and become transformed. To say, my life is going to be laid down for his story to get advanced just a little bit further today. I'm not going to steal. I'm not going to be sexually immoral. I'm going to play nice with others. (laughs) I'm going to learn how to love people. Oh, dang, right? That's just the necessary process of learning how to advance his story. Everybody good? Yeah. This is why we give our money. I'll, I'll just keep going. I just got so much more. Like, this is why we give our money. It's because we get to advance his story. Not because it cleanses you. It gives you peace. Right? It, it moves the story along. You get to participate. His life in you. Your life in him. Establishing his kingdom on this earth. It's amazing, isn't it? And here's the best deal. This is why Paul starts this, this, this chapter in, in, in uh, 1 Corinthians. He's like, you guys are invited into this. As nasty as you are, you guys are in, invited into this because he loves you and he's not going to leave you where he found you. Let's go. Let's go. Amen? Here I am, guys, as your leader, as a leader. I'm saying, I'm inviting you into this. This is more than just advice. You got to get this. You got to get this, that he's invited you into a place. And I'm here to say, come on with me. Let's run, baby. 
Let's find our place in this, ro in, in this role here, in his story, and let's go.